Glad you could join us tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Burroughs, and I serve as director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. And on behalf of the Institute, uh, thanks so much for being with us uh, for this uh, special lecture with Dr. Jennifer Morton. Dr. Morton's research, which we'll be speaking about tonight, is on the social, emotional, and ethical challenges facing first generation and disadvantaged students and their paths towards upper mobility. And this research and this story um, that Dr. Morton will be sharing is especially relevant to our own campus and community. Um, more than 60% of CSUB students are eligible for federal Pell Grants, which is only awarded to students who demonstrate exceptional financial need. And in fall of 2021, 64% uh, of students were the first in their families uh, to pursue a bachelor's degree. I want to thank our supporting sponsors uh, tonight who make this program possible and all of our programs, the Kegley family, Valley Strong Credit Union, Kaiser Permanente, and Adventist Health Bakersfield. I also want to thank our CSUB IT, IT team uh, for helping us tonight with tonight's technology. And uh, before I get into introducing our speaker, just a few notes on procedure for uh, tonight's event. Dr. Morton will deliver uh, her talk titled Moving Up Without Losing Your Way. And following that, I'll moderate a Q&A session and really looking forward to your questions. For those questions, uh, feel free to submit them anytime by the Q&A function in Zoom, the bottom of your screen. And there you can, you don't need to wait till the end of the talk. If something pops up in your mind, feel free to put it in the, the Q&A function and that way it'll be waiting for me when I turn to questions uh, after Dr. Morton's talk, well, which will last for about 30 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for Q&A and discussion. And with that, uh, I'm honored to introduce our guest tonight. So Dr. Jennifer Morton is a Presidential Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, and also a Senior Fellow at the Center for Ethics and Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Previously, she taught at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the City College of New York, and Swarthmore College. She received her PhD from Stanford University and her BA from Princeton, Princeton University, and is herself a first-generation student as well. Uh, her book, Moving Up Without Losing Your Way, the Ethical Costs of Upward Mobility was awarded the Frederick W. Ness Book Award by the Association of American Colleges and Universities and was uh, chosen as the Princeton University pre-read for the class of 2025. Her research has been featured extensively in many venues, uh, including the Atlantic, Inside Higher Education, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the New York Daily News, Public Books, Vox, and many other venues. So with that, uh, Dr. Moore, just to say thank you for being with us. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for welcoming me today. And I'm excited to uh, share uh, um, some insights from my book. And uh, if you'll just give me a minute, I'm gonna set up the screen share, which might take a second here. Uh, Hopefully that'll not hold on. Okay. I'm sure that's doing what I wanted to do. Can you see the presenter view or the slideshow? That is currently presenter view. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, here we go. I think this will fix. We're That's good? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So uh, just a couple words of warning, as I was telling Michael, uh, tonight is one of the first nights that feels like spring in Philly, and I'm on a busy street, so you might hear some background noise. Hopefully, you can still hear me over some of the background noise that people are enjoying a spring night uh, in Philadelphia. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about my book and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the main insight from the book and then I'm gonna end with some just general kind of thoughts about how we should be thinking about higher education going forward. Um, and, and hopefully that'll spur a, a, a Q and A that uh, will be fun for all of us. So let me just set my timer. Okay. Okay, so um, I wrote this book, uh, much of it while I was teaching at the City College of New York in the CUNY system in New York City. Um, and uh, City College is much like CSUB. We served uh, first generation college students, um, uh, students on Pell Grants, uh, many uh, students who were immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants. We were a majority minority school. 
uh, and we served many uh, Latinx students, African American students, Asian students, um, students from all sorts of background. And when I first got to City College, um, as whenever I get to a new institution, I was trying to uh, get to know my students, right? And what I discovered um, as I was getting to know my students was that I shared a lot in common with them. As Michael said, I myself am a first generation college student, but also that there were some challenges that they were facing in their path through college that I hadn't quite faced or not quite in the way that they were facing, but they were different than the idea that we generally have about the challenges that first generation and low income students face. And so let me start telling you a little bit about Sandra, who is a, a composite of the kind of student that I often encountered at City College. Um, and Sandra came to my office after she had started missing a lot of classes, right? And this would happen quite often. I'd start with, you know, 40 students in a class and about four or five weeks into the semester, a certain percentage of those students would uh, stop showing up, right? And I often didn't know what was happening. So I had to reach out to Sandra to find out. And she came to my office and she was really upset. Um, and she was she was sort of trying to explain to me what was going on with her, right? Sandra, um, at the beginning of class, had been a student that participated. She was bright. She wrote good reading responses. I had no reason to think that uh, she was having trouble with the course material. And in fact, she wasn't. Uh, what she started to tell me about was family drama. And I started to understand this in my students as um, stuff they had going on at home that was you know, putting pressure on their ability to really engage with college. Um, and what I saw in many students like Sandra was that my students were feeling torn, basically torn between being a part of their families and their communities and helping out at home and doing what they needed to do to get their college degree and succeed on this path of upward mobility that they had set them uh, up for themselves. Um, and that's basically the topic of my book. It was in trying to understand this kind of, as I will call this ethically challenging situation that my students were in, that I um, started to realize that there was a lot more going on under the surface. Okay. So we have a traditional narrative of upward mobility that I think a lot of us subscribe to. Um, and this is the idea that if you work hard and you study and you do well in school, uh, the doors of opportunity will open for you. Of course, we all know that the path isn't that simple, that it requires luck, um, that there are financial challenges to paying for college, getting into college. Um, that the zip code you are in can be incredibly determining of what opportunities are open for you. So there have been a lot of challenges to this narrative of upward mobility. Uh, Raj Chetty, uh, economist uh, at Harvard University, has talked about how um, uh, the kind of idea of upward mobility that we used to have in the earlier part of the 20th century is in decline. So he writes here, 90% of children born in the 1940s grew up to earn more than their parents. For over the past 50 years, this measure of the American dream has been in decline. Today, only half of children grow up to earn more than their parents. So there's all this growing skepticism that upward mobility is as common as we think, uh, that it's as common as it used to be. But there are clearly people that do embark on this path of upward mobility successfully. So here we have uh, Sonia Sotomayor, uh, you know, who uh, grew up um, in New York City to a working class family and went on to be on the Supreme Court where she is now, Colin Powell, uh, Howard Schultz, all um, uh, people who grew up working class and who achieved remarkable success through hard work, through education. In my book, I call them strivers and I generally think of first generation and low income students who are seeking upward mobility through education as strivers. For my book, I um, ended up doing interviews with strivers who had succeeded by all accounts, who had uh, found opportunities through higher education and had become professionals and had lives that were economically better than that of their parents 
and who had achieved what we might label as the American dream. So I'm going to tell you the story of Todd, who is one such striver that I feature in the book. Todd grew up um, in a um, majority low income, majority African American neighborhood of Atlanta. Uh, his um, family had grown, his mom had grown up in the neighborhood. His grandpa he lived with his grandparents and his mom and his sister. A lot of his extended family lived in that neighborhood. Um, and Todd went to the neighborhood school. And what he described to me was that the neighborhood school wasn't a good fit for him. He was, uh, you know, as he described it, a, a kind of studious, nerdy little boy. And, and he would often uh, get teased in the school um, and he was bullied. Um, and his mom at one point decided um, that she had to get Todd out of the school because the teacher had been stabbed at the school. And she thought it was, it was just uh, not the right place for him. So what Todd's mother did was she lied about where they lived. So she used a friend's address and her friend lived in a middle class, upper middle class suburban neighborhood of Atlanta. And so Todd started going to uh, a magnet school in that suburban neighborhood. In his old school, Todd's classmates were other um, African-American low income kids like himself. Um, in this new school, um, a lot of his classmates were the children of doctors, dentists, lawyers. Um, many of them were white. They were uh, middle class or upper middle class. So it was, a, it was a really big difference in terms of who his classmates were. But also that in this school, the, the kind of dominating uh, ethos was that everybody was going to go to college, right? And Todd's friends, unlike his previous school at this school, were very intent on the idea of going to college and we're preparing for that. So Todd was going back and forth between his old neighborhood and this new neighborhood um, and figured out by talking to his friend's parents and to his friends and the college counselor and so on at his school, how to apply for college and became the first person in his family to go to college. Um, at, in college, Todd did really well, and then he got um, an internship with the federal government. Uh, and after he finished college, he went to work for the federal government. And when I interviewed Todd, he was pursuing a master's degree at an Ivy League university. This path that Todd had was one that was somewhat unimaginable for many uh, people in his neighborhood. Uh, you know. His, his mom was incredibly proud of him, of course, and um, and he had come very far from the kind of upbringing that he had. And so you might think this is the kind of story of upward mobility that we just tend to uphold as a model. But as I will uh, describe, the story is actually much more complicated than it might initially seem. And um, what I'm going to argue is that in order to gain educational and career opportunities that propel them into the middle class, strivers often have to make sacrifices in many areas of their lives they find valuable, relationships with family and friends, connection to their community, their sense of identity. This is what I call the ethical cost. Now, the reason that I call these ethical um, is um, goes back to a very traditional idea of ethics that we find in philosophy, which is that ethics is about what makes our lives meaningful and valuable, right? And what makes our lives, most of our lives, meaningful and valuable are those relationships we have with family and friends, our connection to our community, to our, um, you know, depending on what community we identify with, our sense of identity. These are really important areas of our lives. And it is this precisely that the path of upward mobility threatens for many strivers. So let's go back to Todd's story, because the first time I probably told Todd's story, it seemed like this uplifting story of someone that had pulled themselves up for, by their bootstraps. But actually, Todd's story is more complicated. So when Todd started going to this magnet school in the suburban um, neighborhood of Atlanta, 
he actually was navigating two very different worlds. And for Todd, it was very important to keep him separate. So he was really nervous that his classmates at the school would find out where he lived, what sort of uh, neighborhood he was growing up in. He never invited anybody over. When he went over to his friends' uh, houses, they're you know, nice, uh, comfortable um, suburban houses, he avoided talking about his family, about his own house, about his neighborhood, about his sibling. He, he was sort of leading these two lives. And when he got to college, he told me that he experienced culture shock. Um, now, Todd did well academically, and, um, but he found it very hard uh, to connect socially to other people at his college. Part of that had to do with uh, money. So Todd was working uh, a lot during college and didn't have a lot of time to socialize. He also didn't have a lot of money to spend on the kind of things that um, some of his classmates were spending money on. But part of it was also cultural. Todd himself said that he just felt sort of disconnected, like he didn't quite get the references and the things that uh, some of his wealthier classmates were talking about. And so he was um, constantly kind of at a distance from them. When he got to his internship, the same thing happened. Uh, Todd enjoyed his work, but he found it hard to become friendly with the other people that worked there. One example he gave me is that uh, when he told people that he was from Atlanta, people would be like, I love Atlanta, that's a great city. And they would mention all of these things they did when they went to vacation on vacation to Atlanta, right? But Todd had grown up in a, a low income household in a neighborhood of Atlanta that middle class people generally don't visit when they're visiting Atlanta for vacation, right? So the references that they would give him, the places they had been to, Todd, despite growing up in Atlanta, hadn't been to any of those places. And so there was already this kind of disconnect there. Um, and, uh, and on the other hand, so as he's finding it hard to make connections in college and in his job, he's also finding that his relationship with his family is getting fractured. And this happens slowly, right? So it's, it's not something that happened quickly, but uh, one example that he gave me was that he used to drive back home a lot, then he moved to DC and it was harder and more expensive to do that, but he would often call his sister. Um, however, as he started making money, his sister would always ask him for money. And Todd had already started sending money back home as soon as he started making money, as soon as he started working. But his sister thought it was never enough, right? And so they would have these arguments about money. And of course, Todd stopped calling as often as he did, right? He started calling less frequently because he found these conversations so painful and difficult. And so he felt like he had distanced himself from his family. So what we have here is someone who by all uh, measures has succeeded, right? They followed the, the kind of formula of upward mobility. They've done all the right things. They've gone to college. They've worked hard. They have a good job. Um, and yet there is this kind of this connection that Todd was experiencing in these various spaces where he found it hard to find community and develop friendships in these new spaces that he was in and these new communities. And at the same time, he found himself increasingly distanced from his home community, from the place in which he had grown up, from his friends, from his extended family. Um, and it's important to note here that the way that Todd described his whole neighborhood was that it was very tightly knit. So his he lived in his grandparents' house and a lot of his extended family lived in the neighborhood and would come over. Uh, the school that he went to, that was the school that his mom ultimately uh, pulled him out on, was one that a lot of his family had gone to and a lot of his cousins went to, and that was very tightly woven into the community, right? So as Todd is, is distancing himself by going to a different school, by uh, moving to DC, he's also distancing himself from this very tight community and when he came back home, when he would come visit, he found himself feeling somewhat alienated um, from that community as well. Okay, so what we see here, um, I argue in the book, is that uh, Todd is making sacrifices uh, on, Todd is sacrificing ethical goods. So the way I think of ethical goods, 
it says that they are those aspects of our lives that we value given meaning, what we may think of as contributing to our flourishing. For strivers, the ethical goods at stake are often relationships with family and friends, connection to community and sense of identity. And it's precisely um, these kind of goods that Todd finds are fraying on the one hand, the, the ethical goods he already had, and he's finding it hard to find them in these new spaces that he's in. What I suggest in the book is that strivers are often in the position of having to make trade-offs. They risk undermining or losing some of these ethical goods for the sake of educational and career opportunities. Now you might ask, how does this happen, right? And I think it's important here to realize that people often in, in, in this kind of situation don't really make a choice to sacrifice these goods. What ends up happening is that people make daily choices that um, end up either undermining one of the goods or undermining another. So let me give you an example from um, that I saw with my own students at CUNY. So CUNY students uh, are, uh, like students at CSUB, 42% are their first in the family to go to college, about 40% come from families that make less than $20,000 a year, 78% uh, are students of color, and these are uh, outdated statistics, I'm sure I haven't. Uh, check them for the most recent, but this is a couple of years ago. And what I saw with my students was that many of them were living at home and um, were living close to home. And then they were going to college to try to get this degree. And what often happened was some, that a student would sort of choose to prioritize their family over their education or their education over their family. It was rather these mundane choices, right? So I had students that would come to my office and say, look, I'm sorry I missed class last week. Uh, my cousin's daycare fell through and I had to take care of my little niece, right? Something like that would come up where someone would say, um, I didn't make it to the test because my grandmother had to go uh, in front of an immigration lawyer and she doesn't speak English and I had to translate for her. Or, you know, uh, I had a student who would be incredibly tired and were in my class always falling asleep but she was working nights and working full time at the same time as she was trying to finish a degree and take classes full time, right? And so students often found themselves in these somewhat impossible situations where one, they're trying to be there for their families, contribute financially or contribute um, by taking care of something that their families need or a neighbor or a friend. Um, and at the same time, um, trying to prioritize their education and their career prospects. And depending on the choices that students made in these day-to-day -day decisions, they might end up finding themselves uh, um, somewhat distanced from family and friends in their community. Or on the other hand, maybe they don't make the choice and they uh, are there for their family um, when they need them or are working so they can support their family, but it makes it harder for them to finish their degree and succeed on the path of mobile mobility. And, and so what I saw was students torn between these two important goods. Okay, so you might think um, that these ethical costs, as I call them in the book, um, are sort of short-term costs that will pay off in the long run, right? But I'm gonna argue that these ethical costs cannot be accounted for in the same way that financial time and other kind of investments can. So you can't think of it like, for example, student debt, right? So uh, many students take out loans uh, in order to pay for college. And the thought is that eventually with a degree in hand, you'll be able to pay off the loan and then so, right? And so uh, of course there's recently been a lot of pushback on this idea, but um, the idea at least is that it's an upfront investment that then can be made up. But you can't think of these ethical sacrifices the students make in this way. Why? So here I borrow a notion from uh, the philosophy of love, which is that um, the relationships that really matter to us are often irreplaceable, right? So if we lose a, lo a loved one uh, for whatever reason, even if we, um, you know, if you, um, uh, lose someone important to you, even if later down the line you uh, find a new friend or you have your own family, um, those new people in your life don't just replace the person that was lost, right? If we thought that people were replaceable in this way, 
we couldn't really make sense of our attachments of the attachments that we have when we love each other and when we uh, care for the people in their lives. What we care for, the people we love, it's them we care for, right? Not just the role they might play in our lives. Um, and so uh, to think that because say Todd um, damaged his relationship with his sister, uh, he will kind of make amends or make it better once he's able to have his own family and have his own kids. Um, it doesn't work that way, right? You don't replace this loss um, by, by finding a new relationship, or at least not generally. Okay, now one question that you might have is, well, don't all college students make these kind of trade-offs, like people leave home, they find a new community, new friends, don't we all kind of have to make these sacrifices? What's so special about strivers? Why am I focusing on that? In the book, I suggest that these ethical costs are disproportionately borne by strivers from disadvantaged communities because of unjust economic, social, and cultural factors that are beyond their control. So it's important to recognize that these ethical costs are not just a necessary part of being a college student. Um, not at all. They're actually costs that are being imposed because of the background structure of injustice in place. Um, so I'm going to quickly just give you a few examples to give you a flavor of that part of the argument in the book. Um, so let's talk about, for example, school segregation and educational opportunity. Now, I'm not going to read this long quote. Uh, it's from the UCLA Civil Rights Project, but it's basically about the, the differences between the kind of school that Todd went to when he um, initially was going to his neighborhood school, right, a school that served majority low income, majority uh, African American students. Those schools we know with concentrated poverty tend to have less qualified teachers, uh, uh, less funding, and more of the problems of poverty um, that we that we see concentrated in this kind of institution that makes it so that students have lower graduation rates, less likely to go to college, and so on, right? And then there's uh, the kind of school that Todd went to once his mom uh, uh, found a way to send him to this more uh, middle class uh, suburban school, which is a school that had good funding, was a magnet program, most of his classmates were going to college, uh, there was a lot of uh, parental involvement, extracurriculars, AP classes, all that stuff, right? So what we end up with is a situation in which if Todd wanted to go to school or if Todd's mom wanted him to go to a school that had these opportunities for mobility in her neighborhood with her community, with her uh, cousins and, and nephews and nieces, there was no such option. The neighborhood school was a school that didn't offer these opportunities that Todd needed. And in order for Todd to access those opportunities, he had to go somewhere else. That's not true of someone who grew up in that upper middle class suburban school who could go to the neighborhood school and go to a quote unquote good school uh, or a school that offered these paths to mobility. Or if they chose, they could go to a different school somewhere else. But the school um, that their neighbors went to was a good school. And that wasn't true for Todd. Um, his school had a lot of problems uh, that made it hard for students in those schools to end up uh, attending college and accessing mobility. Okay, another part of this is also thinking about the inadequate safety net. So Sarah Goldrick Robb, a uh, sociologist at Temple, uh, wrote this book, Paying the Price, which is a great book about uh, college costs um, and financial aid. And she talks about the sorts of choices that students make when they're trying to help their parents financially and at the same time go to school, right? So she talks about Nima, whose um, dad was disabled and she needed to work in order to help her family. But the work that she was doing left her too tired to really do well in school. And so she found herself torn between providing for her family and doing well in school. But of course, this isn't the situation that um, all students face. It's only uh, those who are living at the edge of poverty and don't have an adequate safety net to, to hold them up, right? So Nima had to step in where the safety net failed. 
Okay, the final element here is uh, cultural mismatch, uh, um, which is uh, this idea that there's a kind of culture that dominates some college campuses. Um, so here, Nicole Stevens, she's a psychologist at Northwestern, talks about how first generation college students often have an interdependent cultural model where selective college campuses are often dominated by an independent cultural model. And this cultural, she calls it mismatch, makes it more difficult for first-generation college students to navigate and succeed in college. So let me just give an example here. Um, so um, what, what Stevens did was um, go to, I think it, she did this initial research at Stanford and Berkeley and asked administrators, faculty, and students to cite reasons the students go to college, right? And she basically found a pattern, which was that lots of first generation college students said things like help my family out after I'm done with college, be a role model for people in my community, bring honor to my family. Students whose parents had gone to college, uh, who tend to be more affluent, administrators and faculty tended to say things like expand my knowledge of the world, become an independent thinker, explore new interests. She labels these as independent items we, uh, as compared to interdependent. The idea with the interdependent is that the way that you see the world is through community, through relationships, through your place within a neighborhood or your family, whereas independent items are about the pursuit of individual passions, interests, ambitions, and so on. Um, and, and she thinks that there is often this kind of mismatch that um, first generation college students arrive to campus with this more community um, based way of thinking about what their education is for and encounter a campus that's structured around this more independent way of thinking. Okay, I am running out of time. So I'm just gonna zoom past this a little bit. Uh, Anthony Jack in his book, The Privileged Poor also talks about this cultural disconnect um, I'm going, uh, happy to talk about that in Q&A. Um, but what we see, and I think COVID has really brought it up, is that the failures of the safety net often fall disproportionately on college-age adults who are in many cases best able to provide care and financial support to their families, friends, and communities. But doing so leaves them with little time or resources to pursue their own educational and career goals and the pandemic has revealed and magnified this critical role this driver's play right so we've seen it i think we've seen in the pandemic how frequently um strivers are torn between pursuing their own educational and career ambitions and playing these critical support roles that they play for family okay um in the book i i suggest that one thing that we can do is empower strivers with uh, what I call cleared eye ethical narratives. And what I mean by that is that we need to acknowledge that there are costs to upward mobility, right? That there are going to be downsides and that those might be painful sacrifices that strivers make. We need to help strivers situate those in a broader context, understand that they're not uh, the fault of the striver, but the fault in some ways of the, the situation they're in. So I was struck in my interviews when people would um, say things like, I was a bad brother, or I'm a bad uh, daughter, or a bad son, because I you know, ended up prioritizing uh, pursuing this career opportunity or pursuing this educational opportunity instead of being there for my family, instead of acknowledging that it's a feature of the context that they're in. And so I think we can help students think clearly about the trade-offs that are required for mobility. And, Happy to talk more about this um, in Q&A because I think this is a, a, a really rich discussion that we can have about how strivers can navigate upward mobility and still stay connected to these values and relationships that are so central to who they are. But I think we also need to rethink the role of the university here. So I think upward mobility is not the key to equal opportunity. I think it's an imperfect metric that we can use to evaluate some limited gains, but there are high costs to system design to increase it. So one point that um, it's important to acknowledge here is that when these relationships are strained by upward mobility, it's not just the striver who loses out. 
right? It's a friend, a neighbor, a family member who also loses something important and of value. So what we should be after is a system of educational opportunities that lifts us all. And such a system, I think, would not focus on mobility of individuals, but on the flourishing of all who are touched by it. So I think that the focus on mobility is actually too narrow to encompass the many things that university and colleges do. Uh, we want to know not only whether students are moving up, but how their lives are being transformed and enriched through education. We want universities to not only be places that enable students to move up the socioeconomic ladder, but also places that enable students to pursue knowledge. And I think many students attend college to discover new sources of value, not just to increase its socioeconomic standing. So I think there are lots of reasons, not just some of the reasons that I discussed in my book, but just lots of reasons to reconsider putting mobility at the center um, of how we think about higher education. I think the pandemic has further revealed the inadequacies of our narratives around higher education and upward mobility. And I think it has also shown us the importance of these ethical goods, family, friendship, community, to leading flourishing lives. And I think a lot of us are seeing how our lives are diminished when we don't invest in those important sources of value. I, I think we've seen that the failures in the safety net undermine our capacity to enjoy these ethical goods and to flourish. And I think this is an opportunity for all of us to develop a new approach to higher education and to the distribution of opportunity. Okay, here are some of the people who contributed uh, funding to uh, making the book happen. And I really thank you for your time and I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Morton, uh, for your talk and yeah, looking forward to uh, discussion as well. Um, so just wanna invite everybody uh, to uh, please feel free to enter your questions into the queue and uh, get to the, as many of those as, as possible tonight for Dr. Morton. And, do see a question here. So uh, I'm gonna start us off. This is a question from uh, Dr. Brick McDill. Um, so Dr. Morton, can you please explain more uh, how you came to define personal costs borne by strivers as specifically ethical costs? Can you say more about yeah, how you came to that finding and, and what that means? Yeah, great. Um, thank you for this question. So I uh, struggled with really how to conceptualize these costs. And I think the, the reason I ended up choosing the word ethical is that I think it's important to acknowledge that these are goods that are essential to a flourishing life, but also that they're not just goods that are good for the striver, right? So uh, a robust uh, parent-child relationship, a robust relationship between siblings, between neighbors, between friends, um, it's a good that's not just a good for me, it's a good for us, right? Um, and so when those goods are threatened by mobility, I think it's not just a good that I lose, it's a good that we lose. And, and, and that's an important part of the picture. Um, Dr. Morris, you talked about um, the navigating the tension with students between um, upward mobility, uh, the goods that come with that, and some of the trade-offs that have to happen in that process, uh, potentially, um, with some well, bearing some of the ethical costs that you're you're mentioning. Um, can you talk a bit more about how you think about navigating that tension with students? I mean, I'm sure it's probably highly context specific, but yeah. are there things you keep in mind in that process, or experiences you've had where you feel like you've navigated that successfully that could shed light on that for for others yeah. in the audience? Good. I, I, one of the goals I had with writing the book was to uh, put on the table the possibility that when students didn't pursue the path of upward mobility, they might be making a perfectly ethical, rational choice uh, and responding to goods that are important and that we should all understand are, are, are important to leading a flourishing life. Um, and so I think the first uh, kind of thought that I have when I talk to a student about this is that um, I don't know what the right answer is for the student, right? Because it's actually a really difficult ethical dilemma. And it's not an obvious thing that uh, 
getting that degree um, or taking that job across the country is the thing to do, right? Though I'm very tempted. I, I, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, of course you should like finish your degree. You only have a couple more classes. Um, but I um, also know that the kind of sacrifices the students make, the pressures they're under, the feelings of guilt that they might have if they uh, walk away from, say, an ailing parent, are, are those are really heavy burdens to carry too. Um, and so the way that I think about it is you're trying to help the student articulate this decision in a way that um, allows them to realize it's an ethical thing. It's not obvious, right? There are different goods at stake. There are values on both sides. And, um, and that it's a decision they will have to make and decide what they want to prioritize. And it's very personal. Um, and, and so what I often try to do when I talk to students through this, and again, as you said, uh, Michael, it's very complex sensitive, but it's to not uh, convey to them that I think there's an obvious answer here. And I'm just trying to guide the student to the obvious answer um, or to, uh, a lot of times students they themselves think there's an obvious, an obvious answer, but they feel it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. and so I think sometimes helping them articulate why it doesn't feel right can just be the source of like relief. It's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not just being irrational or weak willed or like uh, going against like the obviously right thing to do. There's actually something on the other side. There's something I'm responding to on this other side. Um, and I think that by itself can just be so uh, powerful for students who are feeling really torn that you're not sort of really tipping, you know, you're not on one side of the scale saying like, here's the obvious thing to do. Uh, you're kind of making a mistake by thinking that there is some sort of conflict here. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging the conflict. So one of the um, strivers that I talked to in the book recounts a story, which I, I think is so powerful about being torn his sister uh, had problems with drug addiction. And at some point she came to stay in his dorm with him while he was in college. And that's when he had to be like, you can't stay here. Cause she was, you know, it was very distracting to, to what uh, he was trying to do. And, and he was finding it really hard to um, go to school and have her stay with him. And so he had to tell her to leave and he just felt so guilty and depressed about it. And went to the office of college counseling and the, uh, uh you know the college counselor or the caps person or the, the psychological services person was basically like you shouldn't feel guilty <laughs> like it's not your responsibility or something like that and he right. told me that was the moment he never went back right because he just felt so like she didn't get it and it was right. so demeaning or disrespectful for her to tell him that his feelings were wrong when he right you know, really just felt so guilty about this choice he had made. And so I think that's like definitely not the right approach of the situation the strivers are in. Thank you for that, that response. And uh, we have a question from, uh, I believe it's Robbie, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, mispronouncing your name, um, but the, the question is, uh, as a secondary educator, uh, is there a way I can help my students be prepared and supported as they consider their paths after high school and into furthering their education? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Ruby. That's such a uh, good question. And um, one um, aspect of this that I, I, I would love to see is just being more open with students um, about the fact that they're making choices that involve values um, and that they need to articulate these values to themselves instead of just uh, taking the value narratives we offer them, right? Because there's so many narratives out there that are being offered to them on social media, on uh, TV, uh, from their parents, from teachers. And, and what I see with my students is that often they like have a sense that this isn't the right story for them, but they don't really have a chance to articulate a story that feels authentic to who they are and what they really care about. Um, and there isn't a lot of space for that, I think, in, in both, sadly, in both high school and college, actually, right? So sometimes I'll talk to my students, I'm teaching a first year seminar right now, um, and talking to my students through some of this stuff, and they 
haven't really had a chance to think through um, how they're making decisions or why they're making them. They get to college and they think there's a path and a, like a sequence of steps that they need to take. Um, and there's like the right path. And uh, some of them are, are on that path and they're doing all the things and it doesn't feel right, but they, but they haven't really had the space to step back and say, like, what is the right path for me? Um, and, and often that might not look like the path that's on offer, um, like the easy story to tell. And so I think giving students that agency, um, you know, earlier on to arrive to college in some ways more empowered to think I'm taking a hold of my education and figuring out what matters to me um, can be helpful. So uh, Dr. Moore, I was going to ask you, you know, to what, what extent does your personal story and journey factor into the book that you wrote? And maybe could you talk a bit about the connection between that and, and yeah. the research and work you're doing? Yeah, great. Um, so I'm a first generation college student. I'm also an immigrant. So I came to the United States to go to college. Um, and to some extent, one of the aspects of my experience that I discuss in the book is that I had a very ready narrative to tell myself when I was feeling disconnected, where I was like making these sacrifices and felt guilty because I was an immigrant. And so I came to the United States kind of ready to feel disconnected and not to feel at home in college and to miss my family and to miss my community and to miss my country. And, and so um, I didn't interpret some of these challenges I had immediately as about me. I mean, sometimes I did. I was subject to some of the same first generation, I think kind of like imposter syndrome stuff. Um, but, but I think I often had this story to tell myself. And that's why I think stories are so important where I said, look, yes, of course you don't understand everything that's going on here. You weren't born in this country. You're like, don't, are not fully familiar with the culture. I also was just more willing to ask people for help and to explain things to me very explicitly because I um, needed them to explain it to me and I wasn't really ashamed about asking for that. Um, whereas I think what I've seen with some of my students who are first generation or who are low income, it's a lot of shame in, in that not knowing Mm -hmm. um, or in the kind of quote unquote mistakes that they right. might be making and feeling like, ah, like I shouldn't ask the professor about this, or I don't fully understand this, but I don't want to reveal that I don't know. Right. right. Whereas I, I was ready to not know and to ask for help because as an immigrant, I feel like I, I had that story to tell myself, which is like, it's not about me that I don't know you know, what the norm is around here with respect to this. It's just that I haven't grown up in this environment and so I don't know. Right. Um, so for me, that was really helpful. Um, but I also I related in writing the book and, and working at CUNY to a lot of the challenges that my students faced in being um, sometimes unable to explain to their families what they were up to or the choices they were making. That can also be part of the disconnect where you um, don't know how to explain to someone who hasn't gone to college, who uh, hasn't been through this educational system of opportunity, um, of the way that in which opportunities are distributed in the United States, exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and so I found a lot um, of commonality with my students, although my situation, I, I uh, was much more economically privileged than a lot of my students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's, it's, it's really helpful context and just interesting to, to hear. Um, so Dr. Martin, another question comes from, uh, or comment and question from Mylin. Um, so thanks so much for your touching lecture. Um, do you have any affirmations for students who are experiencing the loss of the ethical costs that you spoke of that you keep in mind or commonly share? Yeah, I don't know if I have affirmations. So I do, I think um, um, one thing that I, I try to tell students and, and, and to some extent myself is that, that those feelings of guilt and regret 
are part of what it is to to be on the path of upper mobility and they're not to be ex sort of explained away or uh, to feel guilty about, right? I think whenever we sacrifice anything of value, uh, we feel some regret, even if all things considered the choice was good, right? So that might have been the right choice to make and we can still feel regret that the thing that we love is that we don't have it as close to us as we used to. Um, and that's totally fine. I think we need to uh, make space for that. And to some extent, we we don't have a lot of space for that because we want to say of the person who quote unquote succeeded, right? They have everything they could, you know, that you have the job and you have your degree and you're making good money and you have, I don't know, healthcare, right? Like what, uh, what do you have to feel regret about or guilt about? Um, but the fact that there were important goods in our lives that we ended up sacrificing is good reason to feel regret. And so I, I think that we we should kind of like allow ourselves to have those feelings. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question from, uh, from Brick here. Um, within what ethical system would you place the idea of strivers? And I believe it's either accumulating or contributing ethical goods or maybe both. Yeah, so um, to some extent, I'm using the notion here of human flourishing, right? And so uh, you might think of this as like an Aristotelian notion. I'm not like, you know, a, a committed or Aristotelian or something like that. But, um, but I'm thinking of these ethical goods within that system in which we think there are different kinds of values that contribute to a flourishing life. And critically, um, the material and social conditions we're in can make it easier or harder for us to incorporate some of those goods into our lives and to flourish in the way that we want to flourish, right? And so what's really important, I think, to keep in mind is that um, this background structure of how we've distributed opportunities makes it very hard for, uh, you know, to take an example of when I was teaching at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, where I had first generation college students, low income students who were from rural parts of North Carolina. For them, pursuing mobility through education and pursuing better opportunities, it was leaving home forever often. Mm -hmm. And their families knew that, their communities knew that, they knew that, and that's a function of how we've structured opportunity. It's not a necessary, feature of uh, being educated that you have to sort of leave home and, um, and and live far from your family and not be a part of your community. But it is the way that we've organized things. Um, and, um, and so, you know, and I think, I want to go back to Aristotle. Aristotle also had this notion that actually like, the, the actual material circumstances in which we live can impact what kind of goods we can have in our life. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I wish we have a comment from uh, CCB President, Dr. Lynette Zelezny. So thanks so, so much for being with us tonight, President Zelezny, um, who writes, uh, thank you for sharing such meaningful scholarly and personal insights, Dr. Morton. Powerful lessons as we strive to support our striving students as they seek flourishing lives. Grateful for your research presentation that has positively reframed my active listening, mentorship, and leadership. So. Thanks for that yeah, comment. Thank Dr. you. President. That's very kind. Yeah, thank you for being here too. We appreciate that and your support. Um, I, I have a question. I'll, I'll sorry, you know, we're getting close to time here. So, folks, if you have any final questions, uh, please do put them in the queue or uh, have maybe time for you know maybe one or two more. Um, but I was going to ask you uh, to talk about your research process for this book. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. some of the student names being. Um, I can't remember the, the word you use, but kind of a, a collection of students. Oh, a composite. Yeah, I, yes, one, there was one student where I, I kind of made a composite. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what, was, what was the process of, like, you know, to what extent were you engaging with students directly kind of in the field yeah. around this? How was that relating to your philosophical research at the same time? Can you talk about that process a little bit? Yeah. So when I initially was writing the book, I was relying on a lot of social science research and was writing it in a much more gear towards the scholarly literature on higher education. Mm -hmm. And in the process of writing my book, 
I was talking with my editor and, and he was sort of pushing me on who's the audience for the book, right? Um, and I started to think about the, the, the audience of the book and I thought, you know, I want something that like me, <laughs> you know, when I was a college student could have picked up and like engage with. Mm -hmm. And I realized that uh, a lot of the ways in which I was writing the book wasn't going to do that, right? Um, and so um, that, plus the fact that uh, the social sciences uh, was very helpful in, in, in me thinking through the ideas in the book, but they weren't asking some of the questions that I wanted to ask, led me to do interviews for the book, which is not weird as a philosopher. Uh, but um, I kind of had the ideas laid out and I wanted stories that someone could read and think, I see how this idea kind of, yeah, is exemplified by the story, but I act, I also feel connected to the story. And what I really wanted was a kind of sense of empathy, which was really what led me to the research of the book, which was working with students. And just, you know, when I first got there, I was really trying to help my students succeed and, and, and feeling very frustrated by not being able to, um, you know, get the student who all of a sudden is doing great and stops coming to class. <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, you you have it in you to finish this class, right? Yes. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that feeling. Yes. <laughs> um, and and then thinking, okay, what is going on in the student's life? Like, why are they making these decisions? And then just realizing the enormity of all the stuff that they had going on and thinking, right. you know, like, I I wanted it to come from a place of empathy. And I think the best way to connect empathetically to the situation is to hear the stories of people who have gone through it. Yes. Um, and so that's what moved me to have these like more interview based stories that helped kind of put uh, a narrative around these somewhat abstract ideas. Thank you for that, it's helpful. Um, so uh, perhaps our uh, final question here comes from Dr. Nate Olson. Um, thank you for your talk, Dr. Morton. I really enjoyed your book as well. Uh, I think one tension that first generation students sometimes experience is feeling that they want their families to be proud of their accomplishments while also feeling the cost that getting those accomplishments can require, like time away from family, which are both interpersonal ways of thinking of college. I wonder if you found this tension in your interviews. Yes, I definitely did. I think that um, families are in a similar position to strivers in some ways because you know, there were some cases, some people I interviewed where the family was really, um, I don't want to say opposed, but didn't, didn't value the, the educational journey that their child was on. But that was very rare. Most families were very supportive, very proud of the accomplishments, but also like it, it was complicated in the same way, right? They, they would also express this sometimes like you think you're better than me or you know like they would have these conflicted relationships with their child that I think both um, were about being proud and also about uh, mourning this connection that they used to have with their child that now they no longer had um, and um and, and that that was really striking. And so by the end of the book, I said, you know, like I part of me would would want to talk to the parents, too, or to the people who who are, are not on the path of upper mobility, but they're trying to support someone through that path and see someone through the path and are also making sacrifices for that. Right. And I think about this like in my own story with my grandmother. I grew up with my grandmother. Uh, who from when I was little, I grew up in Peru, was like, you have to leave this country. <laughs> like, there are no opportunities here. You have to leave. You know, they sent me to this very expensive private school, like all these sacrifices so that I would leave. Um, and and for my working class grandmother, I know that this was pain, like difficult because we're very close. That in effect, she was saying like, go away <laughs> mm -hmm. for your own good. And yet... Uh, knowing full well that this distance was going to come with it. Um, and so I think parents and caregivers also are in this difficult position of thinking, I want the best for my child. I also love my child. I want them to be close. Um, and, and I can't seem to get both of those things at the same time. Right. 
So, um, Professor Morgan, we do have a, a, a question here that I think is important to address uh, from Professor Katie Hansen. Um, he says, thanks so much for being here, Dr. Morton. Uh, as, I, as I think about helping my striving students, I can't help but think about the importance of having periods of rest when we are striving. Do you agree yeah. that this, this rest is necessary? And if so, how do you think students can incorporate rest into their routines, which is no easy task sometimes, right? So. Yeah, I, this is a tricky one also because I've been thinking about this a lot, um, Katie, with, uh, uh, you know, different institutions I've been on have different sorts of students with different challenges and, you know, the institution I'm at now, there are first generation students, they're low income students, but there are also lots of really affluent students. And what I see with a lot of my students is this no space for rest, actually, across the socioeconomic <laughs> spectrum, in fact. Um, and so I've been trying to have this conversation with my students. And um, one notion that I've been using is we're reading this book by a philosopher of Chicago, Agnes Callard, on aspiration. Right? And she has this idea that aspiration is the acquisition of new value. It's kind of like encountering a new value you didn't even know you might be excited about and then like getting into it and thinking you know you uh go to a literature class or something or poetry you're like oh i love poetry i want more of this i'm gonna start you know pursuing it um and what i've been talking to my students is that when they come to college and they have everything planned out and worked out and they have no sort of wiggle room right or space or um, that it's unlikely that they're going to have these encounters that might actually really transform their lives because they encounter something they didn't think they were going to encounter at some like extra, you know, it doesn't even have to be an extracurricular, but they're like maybe out in the quad or whatever, right? Like taking a break and they hear some beautiful music and they might think like, what, you know, what is that? I've never heard that instrument or I want to know more, but you don't leave yourself room for those sorts of encounters if everything is so tightly structured around this goal um, that you that you walk onto campus with, right? And so I think actually a lot of students, not just strivers, but many students aren't giving themselves this space to, to sort of wander and to um, let, uh, you know, a little bit of the world come into their lives in these unstructured ways. Um, so I think it's important for everyone, but the way I've been talking about it with my students is that sometimes uh, to have the kind of passion about what they're into that they want to have, they need to allow space in their lives for those sorts of interests to creep in. And if you're so like focused on like, I'm pre-med and I'm taking these classes and then I'm going to do these extracurriculars and then there's going to be this internship or I need to work these many. And I think for students, who don't have a lot of resources, this is even harder, right? Because they have to, they have to work and they have to um, be thinking very strategically about college. And then there's none of this space for all of this other, um, uh, all of this uh, other value to enter their lives. And um, it's hard. I, and I think in particular for strivers, it's really hard to say, look, you might find a new community and new friends, but you need to be hanging out around campus when maybe you don't need to be. And I think, look, I have a job. There are other things I could be doing. Uh, so to some extent, that is also on, on us at institutions that can sort of build that into the curriculum and into the, to the student's day, right? Into what we're asking students to do and how they move through our institutions to sort of force them in a way to have a little bit of that space. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Um, so I just want to, I think a great way to close out tonight. We have a comment uh, from anonymous Cindy, but notes, thank you for your words, Dr. Morton. As a first generation student, um, I felt much guilt throughout my college career and it's comforting to hear my feelings are shared and valid. Very much looking forward to reading your book. And, oh, thank you. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, so again, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Borden, and, and thanks to our community and, and campus for, for coming out for the talk. Um, as always, we appreciate the support. I appreciate you engaging in these conversations with us. Um, hope everybody is safe and well, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at uh, our next KIE event. Um, so take care. Dr. Morton, again, thank you. Be well. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Thank you for all the great questions. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.